All right, go back over here. So, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Hmm. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Oh, we fished all night. No, don't walk like the Gentiles do. Don't walk the way you used to walk, right? In the futility of their minds. <laughs> you had some stinking thinking. Oh. Before. You had stinking thinking before. In the futility of your minds. They are darkened in their understanding. Yeah. Comes back down to that word. Understanding. So check this out. If you don't have unity, there's a deeper root of these three, and that's lack of understanding. Why aren't you humble? Because you don't understand that your way doesn't work. You see? Understanding your way doesn't work brings humility. Understanding. understanding that something can be broken brings gentleness. Understanding that you've been shown mercy helps you show mercy and be patient. You see? So lack of understanding. They were darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance. That means that you just don't know. Lack of knowledge. That is in them. Due to the hardness of their heart. You want to know how to stop understanding? Stop being humble. The moment you say, yeah, but I've been doing it all night. I've been fishing all night long. The way I've been doing it. That's how I've always done it. Or I know. You just hardened your heart. Or I know how to do this. Or I already know this. Right? <laughs> no. I already know this. I'm, all right, man. I'm, you just I'm, hardened I'm, your heart. I've done that. The moment you, seriously, the moment you say, man, I already know. You've Harden your heart. Now you won't be able to be receiving. You won't be able to grow. See? The hardness of their heart. They have become callous mm -hmm. and have given themselves up to. Watch this. The next step. You start hardening your heart. You start. Okay, so everybody says this. Well, I already know. I've had people come to the program before. Check this out. They come to the program before. They'll say, Look, I already know all this stuff. You know? I'm thinking, Okay, and, and that's why. Because you already know all this. Here. That's why you're here. Why? Because you're callous. You already know. You see? You already know. So watch this. You know what the next step is? It says if you harden your heart and you callous yourself, the very next step is, and they have been giving themselves up to sensuality. Greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That's what happens. When you harden your heart, you become callous and you say, I already know. The next step is no longer unity. It's selfish driven. I already know all this. and you're It just happens. When you callous yourself, you harden your heart, the next step is sin. You see? That make sense? I know this. Powerful stuff. Huh? I know this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really had a guy come one time. Both of these guys were super smart in the Word of God. They were like spouting it out. In fact, one guy even took over my Bible study once. I had to kick him out the next day. But, um, <laughs> but the thing is, both of these guys kept on talking like they knew everything. And I just looked at him and I said, you know what your problem is? You love the world. You know the Word, but you don't love it. You don't live the Word. You know the Word, but you don't love God. You love yourself and you love the world. The love of the world is what's killing your... It's killing you. And they just looked at each other and said, well, they got me on that one. You know, both of those guys. Well, they got me on that one. I love the world and what it has to offer. That's true. Why? Because of a hardness of heart and a callousness. It always begins with that. Once we start hardening our heart and we can't be humble anymore and understand that our way doesn't work, the next thing we know is we embrace our way. And the scripture says there is a way that seems right to man, Amen. and in the end it leads to destruction. Right down that road. So, anyway, it's pretty good stuff. And having given themselves over to sensuality, greed to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. Watch this. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. We're talking about being living in a worthy manner. He's talking about your former manner. <laughs> former manner of life, and is corrupt... Through deceitful desires. 
And to be, watch this, renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in, tr in, in true righteousness and holiness. Watch this. Now it says, therefore, so we understand that our old way isn't working now. We're submitting to God. We're not going to be hardened in heart. We're not going to be callous, but we're going to seek God with all of our heart, right? Yeah. All right, you'll hear me? Yes, sir. All right, cool. Therefore, having put away falsehood, that's what it is when you say, uh, when you embrace a lie about yourself. Well, this is the way I've always been. No, that's a falsehood. It's always not worked for you, right? Uh, have, having put away falsehood, let each one of you to speak the truth with his neighbor. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting distracted about it. <laughs> uh, for we are members, watch this, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Watch this, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Amen. So when you wake up angry, you know why you woke up angry? Because last night you didn't deal with your anger. Now, how do you deal with anger? Number one, you talk about it with whoever you're angry with. Number two, you forgive. You let go. You let it go. Just really let go. If you wake up angry, it means that last night you didn't let it go. And you could even talk about it with somebody, try to hash it out, then go to bed, but you still never let it go. You went to bed on your anger. You know what that does? It's like putting it on a crock pot and forgetting about it. Eventually it burns. Yeah. Eventually it will burn. We did that one time. I had a piece of chicken in here one time. Put it on the crock pot. Dude, I come back the next day. The guy had fallen asleep. The next day, I come back in and the whole house rank. It's rank of burnt chicken in the crock pot. You know, because all the water eventually dried up, yeah. and then started burning chicken. Eating the meat up. It was nasty. All right. <clears throat> you do not let the sun go down. You're angry, and give no opportunity to the devil. Whenever we go to bed angry, and we don't let things go, we give opportunity to the devil. Okay. Let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor, doing honest work, honest work with his hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Look at that. Don't be a thief. Work for what you have. It's good. If you're not working for what you have, you're a thief. Okay? Why? Why? Because God is saying here that we need to work for what we have so that we can be a blessing to others. It's not just so you can have enough. The whole purpose is unity. The whole purpose is being able to give to other people. The whole purpose is so that I can work and have enough to help those who are really down on their luck. You see? That's the real truth. I want to be a blessing, not someone who just... There comes a point when we stop being babies, where we just take, 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 and we become adults, and we start to give. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. In our minds, in our, in our bodies, in our spirit, all three levels, you know? We stop just taking. We're not... Everyone, you know what happens when people say, well, here's what's... It's a false maturity. It's a false maturity when someone goes to church and says, man, I'm just not getting anything else out of that teaching anymore. I'm going to that church, and I'm just not getting anything else out of that church. Well, obviously, you've come to a point where you've grown up, and you no longer need that milk. So why aren't you feeding other people now? Amen. Come on. You know? But, oh, well, we're going to change churches to go somewhere else where we can be fed. So you want to stay in perpetual immaturity? You want to stay as a perpetual baby, spiritually? Go to the next church and just, well, I'm trying to find someone else who can feed me. You, in other words, you just want to stay an immature Christian the rest of your life. I'm going to be a bottom feeder. If you get it, look, I'm going to tell you right now, I can't go to church now. There's not a church I go to that I don't hear something that I already technically know. Yeah. Okay? I don't go to, I don't, and I'm not saying that in arrogance, I'm trying to make a point here. I go to church not just so I can receive, I go to church so I can give. Yeah. I go to church, and yes, I receive, don't get me wrong. If you, first of all, I learned a long time ago. Things stop learning the day to Yes. I, start, I learned a long time ago that I would go to church and I'm hearing the same stuff again, right? I said, Lord, why am I hearing this again? I already heard this last week. Or I already heard this last few months ago. Or this same, it's the same teaching I heard last year. You know what the Holy Spirit told me? I obviously need to hear it again. <laughs> you missed something. Or you're not living by what it's saying. Or you're not living by it. Exactly. So you know what I realized? Ooh. If I'm hearing this message again, that means I missed something. Or I'm not applying it. Make sense? 
So I stopped going to church anymore, um, trying to find something absolutely, you know, saying, "Oh, well, he needs to come up with some deal and uh, and and throw off the fireworks and, and show the light shows, and yeah. he needs to really entertain me with the word of God today." I stopped doing that and started saying, "Okay, God, what do you have for me to hear today?" Amen. Faith comes by hearing, so I already heard this again. You know what? I need to hear it again because obviously my faith isn't there. Faith comes by hearing, so if I hear it again. That means my faith still needs to be developed in that area. Maybe you didn't get the full understanding of it. Didn't get the full understanding. Well, Maybe there's a... Yeah. You know, like I say, you can hear the same sermon three times and get a different message every time. Mm. You know what makes... You know what uh, really causes people to not take for granted the food that they have? Not having any food at all. Being hungry. Do it every time. If you're hungry, you will eat. Do it every day. If you're not hungry... You'll resist it. In fact, you'll become ungrateful. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So when someone comes to me and says, and I'm just not getting anything else out of that word anymore, I already know they're not hungry. And that's a problem. The Bible says, he, Blessed is he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, for they will be filled. For they should be saved. That's, that's Matthew chapter 5. Blessed is he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, for he will be filled. So when someone says to me, well, I just not get anything outside of that church anymore, you know what that tells me? They won't be filled. They're not hungry. <laughs> they won't be filled. If they were hungry, they'd be filled. Mm -hmm. If they were hungry, then every time they come to church or open their Bible, they would get something. Else. But because they know it all, they become hardened in their heart and calloused. Mm -hmm. and the next the next step is sin. That's in Matthew 5, right? That's chapter 5. Or people who say, you know, well, I just don't see God at that church anymore. God's just not showing up. Well, then you must not be pure in heart. Because the scripture says you as pure in heart will see God. It's not about the church you're going to, man. It's about your heart. Peter didn't go to a nice little church. You know? Went to the house. P Peter, Jesus said, uh, who do you say I am? Peter said, you're the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Peter, for no man showed you this, but the Holy Spirit showed you this. Why? Those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness will be filled. Those who are pure in heart will see God. You don't have to go to church, a certain setting. You don't have to have special music playing to see God. You just have to be pure in heart. <laughs> you don't have to go and hear some great teacher. You just have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is a really good word. Humility. That's what that whole Beatitudes is. Beatitudes is humility in a nutshell. If you go down to the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's humble. Look at it. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Keep your finger there in Ephesians. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's humility. Right? For theirs is the kingdom of God. Listen, when someone realizes that they don't have anything apart from God anyway, they don't consider themselves poor anymore. Mm -hmm. When you realize that everything you have doesn't come from you anyway, it comes from God, you're not poor. I look at myself, I haven't got a, you know, sometimes I, I skip the paychecks, you know, for the ministry because not enough money comes through. And I've looked at people many times and I said, you know what, I'm not poor. My wife will come to me, I'm just tired of being poor. We're not poor, sweetheart. All we got to do is have a bank transfer. We have nothing in our bank, but he has everything in his bank. All I need is a bank transfer. Amen. You see? I'm not poor. I'm connected to the vine. There is no poverty when you're connected to the vine. Amen. There is no poverty when you're connected to daddy's bank account. And all he has to do is move the money. You see? I don't have to worry about it having enough. If there's always going to be enough. All i got to do is put my request in. Big daddy. Right? I mean, the barracks never notice at all. But people at the barracks, they never realize we don't have no money. They just call us and say, hey, we need to go over here. And we say, okay, we move the money over. There's no money in that bank account. Y'all, the barracks card has an, is a different bank account altogether. And it has no money all the time. There's absolutely no money in that bank account except max like $10 at one time. And then Gilbert will say, we need to go to the grocery store. My, my wife will go, okay, move money over, boom. Now you have money. Now you can go and buy your groceries. It's the same thing with our my life personally. I don't have money in the bank. I just call God. Hey, God, I really need this. But it was it over. That's how I live my life. I don't have no extra. The Lord told me a long time ago, hey, Zach, why do you have an emergency fund? I said, well, God, in case of an emergency. 
That's what you got me for. He says, uh, <laughs> let me be your emergency fund, Zach. Fair man. I said, what do you want me to do with this money? He says, uh, whatever, <laughs> whatever, I, whatever I want you to do with it. Yeah, exactly. This is the God Fund. So if I tell you to put this money over to some, over here to this guy, you just go in and give it to him. Amen. So I always had $2,000 in the bank at all times for my emergency. It wasn't yeah. As soon as the Lord told me that, stop becoming my emergency fund. I told my wife, I said, Sarah, this is no longer an emergency fund. This is God's fund. So we're going to live our life. We'll always have this cushion. When God says to bless somebody, we're just going to bless them. We're not going to ask any questions. We're not going to worry about how much we had to give. We're not going to worry about how much is still in the bank. We're just going to give, you know. So then, a year later, here I was in the ministry, had no money. Absolutely nothing. I'm driving my truck, and it dies. Oh, man. Pull over. I said, wave somebody down. They come and jump the car. I rode down the road again. It dies again. Oh, man. I said, God. I think this is a... I told the guy who was driving with me. I said, I think I got an alternator problem. Let's jump it, just jump it up again. So they jump me up again. It takes me out of Walmart, and it dies. I said, I got an alternator problem. The problem was only had like seventy dollars in the bank, seventy or eighty bucks in the bank, and I already knew that an alternator was going to cost me a hundred and sixty. You know, I didn't know for sure how much, but I knew it was going to be over a hundred bucks, and I didn't even have a hundred dollars in the bank. Called up James. Hey James, man, I really need you to jump me and bring me to the part store. I got to check on a part. I said okay, so I hang up the phone. I'm sitting there now. My thoughts start going. I'm like, oh man. How am I going to do this? I got, I, we just got the house out here in Coleman. I was living in Brownwood and had to drive 30 minutes every day to work on the house. I look at the guy, he's trying to tell me his life story, you know, and I'm trying to minister to this guy. But now my brain is somewhere else. I just look at the guy and said, I'm so sorry, dude. I'm, I'm going to have to take a minute. I got to go out back. I got to pray. He said, okay, no problem. So I get out of the car, go back, sit down in the back of the boat, of the, of the, of the, of the, the, tail, the, the tailgate of the truck, and I'm swinging my legs. I said, God, a year ago, you told me I didn't need a, an emergency fund. I said, God, well, I have an emergency. <laughs> and I really need this part, this part in. I can't. I have to have this part. i got to drive to Coleman tomorrow. I got. I have work to do at the barracks. And I can't. I can't not have this part. So I said, God, I thank you. That you, you promised me. You said to me, let me be your emergency fund. I said, God... I'm going to hold you to it in the name of Jesus. So then, James shows up. He comes around the back, gives me a hug, and I just lose it. <laughs> I just start crying like a little baby. You know, finally dry up a little bit. I said, okay, thank you. I said, well, let's go to the parts store so I can wait for my raven to show up. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Elijah lived on the brook. Said by ravens. And the ravens came and fed him, brought food to him every day providing for him. So I was believing that God was going to send something like the raven to me and pay for that part. So I went to the part store I'm knowing full well I didn't have the money for it but expecting God to show up and pay for that part so I could get it replaced that day and go to Coleman the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so James jumps from my car. We drive down to the part store. I go in there. I say, hey man, I need to give me a, a price check on a, on a part in an alternator. I'm going to make sure I have the money for it. Well, yeah, it's $160. I said, well, at that point I knew I didn't have it. So I said, well, just go ahead and print me off the paper so I can, you know, I was just taking the next step. If someone doesn't show up now, I'm going to go home and pray, you know. So I <clears throat> got the paper printed up and I immediately turned around and here's $160 sticking in my face. <laughs> I was like, I told this guy, what? What? It was James. James said, uh, see, I don't pay James very much, but James said actually what now you don't know what what you don't know is when James did this, that was his grocery money, all of his grocery money. He didn't have any more money after that. He told me that when he came to get me, and I told him I needed a part, he said the Holy Spirit told him you're gonna buy that part, whatever it is. So that hundred and sixty dollars was everything that was in his pocket. So he just pulled out all the money out of his pocket and handed it to me. And it just so happened it was like four dollars more than what the part was. And I gave wow. him the change back. You know, and I start bawling and crying again, you know, replace it. But anyway, this has happened to me so many times. God's always provided supernaturally, you know. But well, my point is, you know, I don't have to worry about how much I have. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I don't have to worry about whether I have enough. God has it, period. 
But it was my humbleness. It's not arrogance and pride to no. say, God, I'm going to hold you to your word. No, it's humility. I know what God said about me. He says he's got me. That's how you have Mark remind him. Yeah. Sometimes Actually, sometimes God likes to hear it. You don't yeah. really have to remind him. He just likes to hear it. Well, Were you paying attention? Well, it says yeah. the Bible, Moses had to remind him sometimes. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, the Jews call it. He is a pretty busy guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. But you know what it is? He's already spoken the word. Listen, he's already spoken the word. He's waiting for someone to agree with him. Mm -hmm. So when you pray, your prayer is simply touching his word. Your word touches his word, and it makes a connection. It's just kind of like when you, your rain drops on your window. Have you ever seen a raindrop going down the window, barely, slowly, and then it hits another raindrop, and it goes down real fast? That's what it is, man. God's word is just trickling down, and when it meets our word, it comes down. See what I'm saying? We've got it. It's the cohesiveness. Prayers are cohesive. Ooh, fancy word. Say that again. Prayers are cohesive. I think it's more like our word coming down and then his word, and then we. <laughs> it has to meet his word, yes. Right. When our word meets his word. Right. It's magic, magic. It's good stuff. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, but they will be called, the, they have the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, I, you know how many times I've cried in worship because I know my situation. I know how much I've been forgiven. You know, I've cried, but I'm comforted too at the yeah. same time. And in fact, that's half the reason why I'm crying. <laughs> Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Whenever you realize that everything comes from him and you're humble before him, he exalts you. He lifts you up. You become very confident because you know what you have in him. Blessed are those... Who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be receive mercy. So all these things, merciful, you know another way to say merciful? Blessed are those who are taken advantage of. Blessed are those who allow others to take advantage of them. Good, good word, good word. That's, that's what it is. It's humility. All of these, these descriptions are talking about humble people. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the... Peacemakers. That means they're not sticking to their own way. They want to make peace. They're willing to submit. Talk to one another. Make peace. They don't have to be right. That's what peacemakers are. Peacemakers don't have to always be right. Most definitely. Blessed are those who are persecuted. They're not fighting back. They're being persecuted. For my for righteous sake, for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. In other words, that guy who stands up for what's right, but everyone else ridicules him for it. And he takes the heat for doing what's right. Blessed is the man who per is persecuted for righteousness. Sake. Blessed are those are you when others revile you and persecute you and all, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account because you're claiming Jesus and everyone wants to come against you now. Blessed are you. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for that. So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So again, we're coming down to humility. That's the key to all this. All right, go back over here at Ephesians. We're going to wrap it up. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt and deceitful desires. Be renewed in the, sp in the spirit of your minds. Where are we at? Uh, your past 23. 28. Let's go over it. Let him do honest work with his own hands. Verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up, mm. as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. We want to empower people. We don't want to cripple them. So when you have corrupt talk, the result is people get crippled, whether their emotions get out of whack or they get, um, what do you call it? Um, irritable, or whether they get um, discouraged. See what I'm saying? Maybe they all... Because uh, you don't want your words to be poison. Or when you say something right. that it's infectious to other people. And now, it's your bad attitude it. affects other people's to have that. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up. In other words, if your word is not building up, it is corrupting. Oh, I'm going to say that again. Here's how you know if your word is not good. Is the word you just said 
building up. If it's not building up, let me erase this. It's breaking down. It is breaking down. There's only two kinds of words. There's no neutral word. Every, that's why Jesus says every idle word will be judged. If your word, if the words you speak do not build up, then they uh, are destined to tear down. If your words do not build up, then they are destined to tear down. That word has to be building up. If it's not building up, then it is. Then you can assume that it's tearing down. Okay? Or it's setting up false security. Setting up a false foundation. So when someone comes and leans on it later, it yeah. will crack and break yeah. and fall through. So every word we say must be intentional. Every word we say must be intentional. It has to be full of purpose. If we do not say it with intention and with purpose, then we don't value our own words. The reason why we don't value our own words is probably because we don't think anyone else values our own words. Leave me out of this. Huh? Leave me out of this. <laughs> Still a good word, right? Think about this. If... So we believe the lie. Here's what happens. When, when we stop, work, when, if we're not conscientious of our words, then we believe the lie. We believe that our words don't matter. Right. True. Yeah. Somewhere, someone along the lines told us, or we heard a lie that said, shut up. We don't matter. We don't care what you have to say. Yeah. Every day of my young life. Yes. That's an that is an assignment on your life because God created you to speak. God created you to speak life. God created you to change people's life with your words. And if the devil can come in and get your mind all screwed up out of whack, making you think my words don't matter, then you'll say a bunch of stuff that's foolish, and you'll never amount. You know, your words will never amount to anything to building anybody up. And therefore, the devil has won because he's stolen away your influence. He's stolen away the purpose that God created for your mouth. You see. I can understand why Satan would be afraid of that. Yes, he's intimidated. The devil is intimidated. Because you're not working for him, you're working against him. Yeah. The yeah. devil is intimidated by the power of your words. Oh, man. If he can get you to believe, watch this, if, if, if you can be deceived... To think my words do not matter. <clears throat> then your life will be filled with meaningless words. And then what's going to happen is your worst fears will come upon you. Everybody will look at you and say, shut up. Nobody cares what you have to say. And then you'll, it'll, it'll hammer even deeper, you see, every time it happens. The only reason why I would say that is because now I want to be resistant and say, I have something to say anyway. I'm going to say it. Well, see, that's what I've always said. You can't ignore me. There's only one person on the planet that can ignore me, and you're not my mother. Interesting. Yeah. And you can't. No, but there's a reason why you, there's a reason why you say that though. Yeah. It's because you don't actually value your words. If you did, you would be more intentional. And and what happens is it, is it hammers in. Other people will say, "Man, they're basically saying to you, your words don't matter." So you start believing that even more. But if you would understand that your words matter, then you would be more selective. Yeah. If people understood the power of their words, the weight that their words carry. They would be more selective about what they say, and the scripture says it's a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man knows how to hold it back. Why? Because he knows if... Check this out. Have you ever met someone that was quiet all the time, but when they open their mouth, you shut up and listen? Yeah, because they don't ever talk. Yes, but 
The reason why is because they value their words. And then when they say something, it's actually well, really worth like, listening to. Yeah. Yeah. Worth listening That's to. That's why I can tell you with my mom. She, she would talk, <clears throat> but when you'd ask her a question, and she'd sit back for about five minutes and contemplate about it, and she'd spit it out, and you're like, dude, that's a word. That's a few words, but it's, it's what, you, it what people are seeking, what they're looking for. Yes. And also, right have you ever, yeah. you know, this, you know the, the economics of supply and demand? Yes. If it's readily available, then it becomes super cheap. Mm. If it's rare and hard to find, it becomes High invaluable. That's right. So the same with our words. If we have much speech equals cheap words. Much speak, much speech equals cheap words. If, if I'm selective though, then it creates a demand for them. People start seeking you for advice. Yes. This is why the Bible says, "Be slow, be quick to listen, and slow to speak." The reason why is because if you're quick to listen, slow to speak, all of a sudden your words are put on demand. People want you to speak. People want to come to you. They come to say, I have something I need to talk to you about. I need you to give me some advice. So you open up your ears. You ever heard those, that phrase? You got two ears so you can listen right. twice as much as you talk, right? Right. Yeah. So when, <laughs> when people see that in you, and this is the thing, I'm not saying that, I mean, obviously I can talk a long time, but I also know how to listen. And because I've listened, those people come to me and then I speak a lot. But, but it's becomes. It's because, yes, I learn a lot from listening. But I used to have a big problem with not having a filter with my mouth. I talk all the time. And I remember being in high school, and this is when I stopped. This is when I stopped talking so much. I still talked a lot. It's an assignment of the devil. Listen, God's called me to speak, okay? Or I wouldn't be doing this right now, right? I, I, I love what, uh, what's his name said, um, <clears throat> Lee. Pastor Lee, yeah. he goes, you know, I, I'm getting paid now for what my dad used to get on to me for. Yeah, for real. Dude, I used to be I picked on all the time for talking too much. Me too. You know? I used to be told all the time, shut up, you're annoying. You know? Oh, yeah. You're but sure. it wasn't until I got in high school, this is when it changed for me. When I got in high school, I, was, I would be in a group of football players, and I'd open my mouth and just start talking, and they just start making fun of me. And I started... I stopped talking, you know. I was making fun of my life, but at that moment, something happened to me. I said, you know, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to listen. Dude, I sat down and started listening to their talk, and I saw, you know, they, they thought what I said was meaningless, and I start, sat there and listened, and I realized how meaningless their talk was. And you know what I started realizing, though? I started listening to them. I started really listening to them, and I started realizing how empty their lives were, and my heart broke for them understanding. Oh, I already erased it. I, I became understanding of these people because I was listening for the first time. And I got that whole year, I, it, was a, it was a commission from God for me to be silent and listen. I'd go to Bible studies, I wouldn't even talk. I would listen. I would listen, 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 listen. I was continually trying, I was practicing the art of listening. It wasn't a problem to talk, only if my words had meaning though. You see? And I realized that my own words had lost meaning. These people didn't want to hear me. They didn't want to talk to me. They didn't want me talking. They didn't want me to shut up. So I stopped talking. I started listening. My heart broke for these people. And all of a sudden, I started learning about people. I started getting insight into what made people tick. What made them, what made them act the way they acted. I started having compassion on bullies. Huh? No, I was actually... <laughs> I started having compassion on these jerks, you know. I started having compassion on even annoying people, like myself. <laughs> why? Because I knew why I was doing it. I wanted the attention. I wanted people to give me positive affection. Positive. I wanted people to like me for what I had to say. And then, I, so I would sit there. And, so you know what I did? I listened to everyone. I listened to the bully. And I listened to the annoying guy. I would go sit with people who didn't, who didn't have no friends. And I'd listen to them. Because I realized that they needed someone to listen. 
There was a reason why I dumped my whole life story on someone for two hours when they finally listened, and the next week they never wanted to have anything to do with me. Yeah. And it hurt me when that happened the first time. Oh, yeah. And then I realized, you know, there's just some people that can't handle it. And I realized I need to look for, look for good listeners. Because guess what? Even those guys in the football team that made fun of me at the table, they were good listeners. Or they would have listened to me. Mm-hmm. They didn't understand me. They didn't want to understand me. They had their own problems, apparently. So. You know? And so then I discovered, man, I need to become a good listener to the bully who's macho, who's putting up the front, and I also need to go be a good listener to the one who can't shut up. And I realized, real quickly, um, that God had given me something, you know? And then I started gaining more wisdom and understanding, because I listened a lot more. I started looking at trends, started noticing people who talk like that have a life like this. People who talk like this have a life like this. People who talk like this, the reason why they talk like that is because of this in their their past. And I started noticing things about people. And it broke my heart for a minute. It gave me compassion. And it gave me that humility, gentleness, and patience. And I started making friends with people everywhere. I was no longer considered the, the annoying guy. I, they called me the evangelist. You know what I mean? They saw me as a guy who, who was on fire for God instead of just an annoying person. You know, who didn't know how to shut up. Not, not only the annoying now, not the annoying, but the anointed. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> no longer called annoying, I was called anointed. I like that. <laughs> it's yeah, true. It's you're true. You're anointed by God to, uh, to listen and, 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 and share like what's going on with other people. Yeah. The anointed you that blessing. But it came through humility because I realized that the reason I talked so much was because I wanted approval from people. It was a pride who wanted, you know, pride because I wanted the spotlight. But it was deep rooted insecurity because I really didn't believe that I was all that. I, I needed people to tell me that, uh, which was a falsehood, it was a false foundation. I started discovering that I needed to strengthen myself in God. And then I realized that. Who I was was defined by God, not by what people said. Amen. And so then I stopped looking to men for their approval. And I started looking to God for his approval. And it's tra- just dynamic transformation in my thinking and in the way I handle people. <clears throat> so where are we at? Renewed. To be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Oh, sorry, we're going back. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up. As, is, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath... Bitterness means that you have... Um, you can't forgive. Okay, so here's how bitterness happens. I'm gonna, can I get rid of this? So bitterness is unresolved irritation. Uh, it's resentment. Resentment is when you can't forgive. You can't let go. You can't let it go. That's right. Bitterness. So let go of all bitterness. Rage. Where are we at? Yeah, bitterness, 31. wrath, and anger, clamor, and slander. But put away from you. Be put away from you along with all malice. You get angry and stuff because you didn't let something go. Listen, you want to get angry quickly? The Bible says love is not easily angered. Love is not easily angered. What are we talking about? 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 13. I think it's 2 Corinthians, right? Love is not easily angered. Why? Because it keeps no record of wrong. You want to become bitter? Keep a record of wrongs. Mm. <laughs> so let's say something, man, I'm just... So if you wake up angry every day, that means you have bitterness in your heart. Well, I keep a manual. So when I look at somebody and say, man, you just keep getting angry. It's just because they haven't forgiven somebody or something or whatever. They don't let something go. They're having a hard time letting something go. You know? It comes with, what happens when someone's 
bitter. Two things. Either they yell or they're snide. Outburst or sarcasm? Mm. Pick your poison. I know mine. Little jabs. That's how you know. I don't get it. That's how you know you haven't let something go. Mm. Make sense? Both, you know, are. Uh, a poison. One's passive aggressive, one's just. Um, they're right aggressive. But, but they're both. Eight. And <clears throat> one, you know, he doesn't want to deal with confrontation. One doesn't want to become vulnerable. So they're both cowards. One doesn't want to be exposed. One doesn't want to expose. You see? But love will confront. Love will let down your guard. So it's what we're learning is the art of love. Okay? <laughs> Let all wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another. It's powerful stuff. Be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Ah! Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Verse 5, chapter 5, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Verse 4, Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Take no fruit in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that like button, share it to your friends, and subscribe to our channel for more content every single week. Also, if you haven't yet, be sure to visit our website at bombzs.com. We got a lot of content there, a lot of things for you that are absolutely free. So wow. be sure to utilize us as much as possible. We hope that you have a great day, and God bless.